Hands Off My Podcast is a proud member of DarkCast Network, where the light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. Hola, my beautiful humans. This is Jasmine Castillo. And this is MW. Bringing awareness of murdered and missing Indigenous women, girls, two spirits, the LGBTQ community, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, Black Indigenous people of color. These are their stories. So, welcome to Hands Off, my podcast. In this episode, I get to speak with Arlene Harbison, who is the niece of Leanne Lorares, and she has continued fighting for justice for her uncle, whose body was found along FM 2126 on May 10th, 1996 in Brownwood, Texas. This has been a long journey of justice, and for the past 26 years, Arlene has been doing this on her own, creating a Facebook page, as well as a GoFundMe to hire their own private investigator. Here is Lian Lorares, live through the eyes of Arlene Harbison. So grateful to have you here as a guest on this episode and podcast. Um, because I want to shine that light on Leon. Leon deserves that. That's the least yeah. uh, that he should get. You know, the most I would love to see from uh, this outcome. And I know for damn sure that's the reason why you're fighting so hard yes. is to get justice for him and to find at least some type of comforting closure uh, for you and the family and um, for Leon to be at peace. Some of the articles, as well as knowing that I did mention just briefly that I am part of the Uncovered.com community, and uh, there is a lot of the podcasts that you have have actually gone and done so far since 2021, Mm -hmm. I believe. Uh, Some of them were actually like the fall line, um, Mm -hmm. gone cold in Texas crime, um, and there is a great timeline that they have available there as well, which was very, very useful for me as well as for anyone else who is looking in depth and in following your uncle's story. Yeah, Brady was really, really great help, helping me get the timeline down. So, yeah, I, I really appreciate that. It does put a little bit more perspective into exactly what happened. Yeah. Yeah. And I noticed that there was a lot of names that are involved in or on and off on the case as since 1996. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there was other names on there that were like previous law enforcement that were part of the case. And I mean, that is that is a wonderful start for someone to know more mm-hmm. or no one knew of that because right. I am from the LGBTQ community. Uh, you and I are very common i i did too i was married and had kids too and now I'm married to a woman for the last 11 years so yeah i kind of like came out late in life yeah or mostly it was because leon and i were brought up in this strict um hispanic catholic small conservative town we were not for a long time we weren't even aware of you know our feelings or and then we just, we knew we couldn't talk about it with our families. Mm-hmm. And so for both of us, it took us a long time to, you know, be comfortable with who we are. And he was just starting to come out at that time. And that's what really breaks my heart because he was finally being who he was meant to be. And he was comfortable with that and starting to date. And he was he was deprived of finding the love of his life, getting married, having kids, you know, and getting to know my grandkids, all of that was taken away from him. I think that's the hardest part for me because of if anybody deserved that happiness, it was him. Mm -hmm. And that was taken from him. Oh, that is, it's just, it's so upsetting. I know it's, that's the, when I think about 
his death, that's what hurts me the most, knowing that he didn't get to have all of those things that everyone else does, that this killer is had. But Leon didn't have that because it was taken from him and he was the best person you would ever meet. And he deserved that more than anyone else to find his happiness, you know? Just the thought of how long it takes. I mean, it takes a lifetime Mm -hmm. in some instances to find that special someone and his Mm -hmm. journey just started. And that just infuriates me because even though he has lived his life for those past 30 years, his life didn't become truly his until he became his true self, his freedom. That was his freedom. Do you know how it's like people don't understand the concept of yeah. when you get to that level of the nirvana of who you really are, the freeness, the chains have been broken from the constant ridicule or the constant reconstruction or the race in to, under, to be aware of, you know, girls are supposed to wear dresses and exactly. you're not supposed to do that. That's what boys do. And, and it's like, it's a process. But can you also imagine, like, the courage it took? Yes. Because at that time, Brownwood was very homophobic. And so yeah. I, the courage it took for him. And not only that, like, he never got to live for himself. He grew up taking care of his sick elderly parents then he took care of me then he took care of my kids this was a time when it was he was living for himself Mm -hmm. it took a lot of courage and he finally found somebody to date and then his life is taken it's like Mm -hmm. it's so unfair it is oh my gosh it hurts me I, I, I I I am right along with you and I've been here for going on eight years and I have seen some things. Yeah. Um, you know, how Texas is. Yeah. Yeah. It ain't pretty, especially. Not for us. So I get it. I understand that concept of how we were brought up, mm-hmm. um, the constant strictness in religion. Um, right. But the point of being a person of color and being in the um, Rainbow Mafia and then being in Texas, it's like worst oxymoron you could hear. Like- and then, you know, the conflict between going through sundown towns because you're a, uh, a person of color, but then on top of that, going through towns where being an LGBTQ or being outward about your queerness is completely Scary. and unacceptable. Mm-hmm. Um, and the hate crimes that come in to that, it's saddening. It's extremely saddening that. Yeah. I just wanted to add, you know, like he had many, many obstacles, not only at that time with the AIDS and, you know, where we lived, how he grew up. He didn't have the support of his family because he was afraid to come out to his family. Um, I knew because we grew up together. It wasn't anything we talked about, but I just knew. And so I can't, he was just so brave to you know, finally decide to be who he is. And he didn't have a support system. And so I can't even imagine how hard that is. And I sometimes I have, at the time, I felt like, okay, I know that he's, you know, dating now and making new friends. And so I kind of just left him alone, because I wanted him to enjoy his time, you know, uh, finally, being free not having to take care of anyone else but himself Mm -hmm. and so I didn't spend as much time with him as I always had um but I thought it was because I was giving him his freedom and then now I regret that I didn't you know ask him more questions and be more involved in his new life um because I I always wonder if there was something I could do and so you know I always have that regret you didn't expect this to happen. Nobody really, really in, expects this to happen. I know, but you yeah. expect everyone to live an old age, die in their sleep, and have the, the best life that they wanted. Yeah. But nobody should put the blame on themselves because you didn't know that. It's 
you know, I, you, you put so much pressure on yourself. Don't it's, I know. it's not I, your fault. You didn't and everyone know. tells me that, but I carry so much guilt with me because also that same day, um, I worked at Walmart and so he would often come in, you know, and would talk to me. We'd chat for a while. He, you know, buy some stuff for his coworkers birthdays or whatever. So we, we did visit with each other several times a week that day. Um, I got off of work. I went into the parking lot. I saw his car there and I stopped. I literally stopped and said, should I go back in and find him so I can talk? But I have three kids. I'm really tired. So I went home. So I'll talk to him tomorrow, but tomorrow never came. And so I, I hate myself for not going back in to see him because that would have been the last time. And so I carry that with me every second of every day. Mm. Yeah. Yes. It's all I can say, my dear, I am glad that you were able to have the opportunity to even be in his life, even though it was cut so short. Um, yes, I was very blessed to have him. He, he was my protector. He was my best friend. He was my person. Absolutely. Absolutely. What do you think that Leon valued most in life? Well, that was the easy one. Um, it was his family. Family always came first. Um, he literally lived his life for his family through caring for his parents, caring for me. He took care of my children, helped me raise them. Um, he took care of all of his nieces and nephews. So that was, that was his main goal in life is to take care of his family. Now, I mean, like if you asked anybody, they would tell you that what meant most to him was his family and he showed it every single day. And then when he passed, then I had to take on that role. Um, we're, we're kind of the same people, you know, our personality was very much the same. And so, yeah, I've taken on that role since he passed and every friend, coworker, family member you ask, that will be what they say about him. He loved his family. The times that Leon was most joyful were the holidays. He loved the holidays because we would all gather together. He'd cook for us. He'd bake for us. We enjoyed spending that time together in the kitchen and um, then enjoying the meal of all the wonderful things he prepared for us. Um, that's when I noticed just how happy and how he was enjoying the things that he likes, you know, with his family. He loved cooking. He really did. And so you would get to see the big, bright smile on his face the whole time. It wasn't like it was a chore that he had to cook. It was he enjoyed it. He, he loved that he got to share it with his family. Yeah, I'm I'm just thinking of about, about it now because like usually when I love cooking, I cook different variety of dishes. And when I'm in that mood, all of a sudden I start putting on some music and I start yeah. dancing around with anybody who's in the kitchen, twirling and singing along, you know. Um that was, was him. his yeah, what was his favorite dish that he liked to make? Um I don't think that there was ever one because he also liked you know, we didn't have Google or YouTube or any of those Pinterest, anything like that. So he would just create a lot of his dishes just from, you know, what he thought up. And so now we can't recreate them because there's no recipe, but um, he loved making enchiladas for sure. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yes. And he would make these wonderful like pinwheels with cream cheese, cranberries and you know, crab meat that he would make every Christmas that I make now. You know, I, I can't think of one special dish because he just did a whole bunch. <laughs> wow. Yeah. He sounds like just being creative. Like we had to learn to make a five star meal out of, you know, what yes. was lying around as staples and they would be like the best. That's yeah. a gift too. Cause not that many people can can make it work out like you know 
it's you know we're we're all about the spices they're all about the taste they're all about we live in our food and you can you can taste the love when yes. someone cooks something just like wow and then they're so caught in the moment that you know it was just random you know a dash of this uh, yes. a, a cup <laughs> of that but nobody writes it down like they I used know. to I didn't learn by sight a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. You, you just don't write stuff any down down anymore. <laughs> also, I didn't at the time I didn't appreciate just how wonderful he was and how great these dishes and meals were because he he was growing up in a home where his parents were disabled. They were elderly. They were, you know, had a lot of health issues. So he didn't have a lot of money and he didn't have, you know, the opportunity to go and, you know, get cooking lessons or anything like that. So, I mean, now I appreciate, you know, just how wonderful that was and he was, but I didn't at the time, you know, you just kind of like, it's just, what he does, you know, and we enjoy it. But now it's like, oh my God, he was so awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, you're in the moment and you just don't anticipate to exactly. not have that not stop. Right. Not be around that person, not see them mm-hmm. again. Yeah. Yeah. Especially because we grew up together. He was just always there with me. Mm-hmm. I never anticipated that he wouldn't be with me. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But can you tell me some funny stories about the times that you spent together, if you recall? It wasn't funny memories, but memories of us being together is is love. Mm-hmm. I, I felt his love all the time. It sounds like the relationship that you had was uh, like a, a big brother or, or, or um, a role yeah. model in your life. And... That I call him my big brother and my protector. He was always my protector, mm-hmm. saving me. That's what he was to me. Wow. Did you have any um, favorite stories that you about your childhood? If there was um, anything that you wanted to share? Whenever we um, became teenagers, we played in the high school band together. So we'd go to, you know, football trips together then we started going on Saturday nights. There'd be, um, you know, a Mexican music band playing. And so we, we danced all the cumbias together. Um, he had a jukebox in his room. And so, yeah, we would just play music and just dance and, you know, be silly. I love those times, man. Like music, food. It's yes. like the, the Latina culture. It's life. It's love. It's it Some is. people don't understand oh. it though it's like this is a whole nother level y'all y'all don't know until you actually lived in a latina home mm-hmm. you know how to mix it up you know yeah, <laughs> and that's how you express your love is through food and yeah. music and so yeah we that's what we enjoyed together and it was just him and i doing that so it was like extra special you know mm-hmm. exactly exactly yeah now we had mentioned it before and Leon had a, made a couple of big decisions that have maybe directly or indirectly impacted his life. Can you tell exactly what those were? You know, one of the big decisions was, um, well, first it was when his parents passed away, he had nowhere to go. So, you know, he automatically went to help me because I was a single mom of a two-year-old and, So he moved in with me to help me raise my oldest son. And then I, that I lived in San Angelo at that time. Then I moved to Brownwood and he moved in with me because I had more children. And that's when he started working the graveyard shift so that he could take care of my children during the day while I worked. And again, that's such a big sacrifice, you know, that he made. I I didn't ask him to, he didn't have to do it. He just did. And then, you know, when my kids got older, then he moved in with his brother and he was starting to make friends and he decided to come out and start dating. That was huge. And he had just before he was killed, he had told a friend that 
he was ready to come out with this person that he was dating, but the person he was dating did not want to come out. So he was having to struggle with that. Um, I think that's one of the, probably the hardest decisions he had to make at that time, yeah. but he didn't get the chance to, you know, go any further with that. Like I mentioned before, that is, um, that is brave. And that's something, like I said, if you don't have the family or friend support in regards to coming out as gay in, in the community, it's a make it or break it situation. Um, and Leon didn't know that. He was right. taking a chance like every other person who is in a queer community, like myself. Right. I mean, so it was a huge step for him. And I don't know that that's what really hurts me because it was so hard, but he decided to make that decision and then he didn't get to explore that any further. Right. Yeah. To start a new chapter in his life, overcoming his fear and being who he really is. I mean, that's a beautiful, like he's the chrysalis stage, you know, the metamorphosis stage of our lives. Yeah. And not seeing the results of it. It hits me. We how hard it is yeah it, it hits me because I know that struggle and just just being Texas in general with all the stuff that's been going on with all these politicians and how they're passing things you know I'm living in Texas if I want to have a flag flying in front of my house it's the same thing as like you know I might disagree with somebody who have a confederate flag across the street Thank I don't you. care as long as you don't step on my lawn or be rude to my kids <laughs> to each their own and in 90, in 96, that's, it was just, um, twice as hard, extremely hard. Yeah. And we're not, they weren't as lenient and understanding or accepting as they are 26 f years from, from then. And it's, it's right. And then so, I, from, from yeah. what I understand the history about Brownwood, Texas itself is. It's is still it, like 1996. Yeah. It's extremely excruciating to yes. even be who you want to be and not yeah. be hated on. And I'm from what I understand is that this is possibly um, connected in some way of his passing it is murder, possibly based on whoever that might be the suspect or um, persons who are involved in his murder are new of his past or new of, of him coming out. There are a few reasons why people speculate on what happened um one is that he may have um been dating someone that is connected to law enforcement and because of all the homophobic in law enforcement there that's one of the reasons um also the sheriff at that time recused himself from the case and the Texas Rangers were brought in immediately, which I hear is very strange unless there's like a law enforcement involved shooting or relation to that. And so the Texas Rangers, the one who led the investigation and when they first spoke to the employees that morning, um, they tried to pass on the narrative that Leon was into drugs and he brought this on himself. Everyone that knew Leon and everyone they spoke to said, absolutely not. Leon did not do drugs. Leon was not involved in drugs. He wasn't selling drugs. They kept trying to push that the whole day. Well, when everybody said, no, that's not true. Then the Texas Rangers said that it was a possible hate crime. And so that got me thinking, like, well, how did he know? Because Leon hadn't really come out to maybe just a couple of people and that was it. So how did he know that it's a hate crime? One of my cousins saw Leon parked across the Kroger store and he pulled in, asked him what he was doing. Leon said, I'm waiting for my girlfriend. But of course, this could be, you know, a guy because he hadn't come out to the family. And um, so my cousin asked, well, why are you over here? 
um, Leon said because her father is a highway patrolman and he told me that he would kill me if he ever saw me with her again. So again, there's another connection to law enforcement there. I don't know which is true, uh, that Leon may have seen something he shouldn't have, or it was because he was gay. I can't ever get any answers. I can't get any records. I can't get sheriff's department to speak to me. Um, I did speak to a local to Texas ranger this year, and his words were that the person they suspected committed suicide. And the, the other people that were um, witnesses were either intoxicated or high. So my question was, what witnesses? Who are you talking about? If all these witnesses were intoxicated, was there a party going on? Was there a group that did this? Like, how are there witnesses? And so he said, because they were intoxicated, um, they weren't incredible. But I'm pretty sure that you can still ask questions to a person who's intoxicated or wait until they're sober. That doesn't mean they're not credible. But for some reason, they just dismissed all the witnesses. So I have no idea what is going on or what happened. But I do know that people know who it is. It's a person that has a long rap list, whatever you call it, a long list of arrest and a bad person that everybody knows and very homophobic. And they believe his brother helped him and that he's bragged about it at other parties. And, mm. but this person has some kind of, um, connection to law enforcement where he's allowed to do illegal things and not, you know, get in trouble for them. So I find that maybe that is the reason why no one has been arrested. Interesting. So um, it's very infuriating. I'm trying to be as composed as possible because I actually went off on a tangent. My mind is just racing on how how the hell does someone consider another person's life meaningless or unfortunate circumstance? This happens to be like a trend in Brownwood. Oh. Um, this is not the first or the second unsolved murder that police know who did it, but they are never arrested, even with evidence. With Leon's case, I believe they destroyed all evidence. Oh. Oh my gosh. Um, I spoke to the records keeper and I said, you know, I want to know if you've done any testing because, you know, all the improvements that have happened in the last 10 years, can we test it? Her answer was, we've done everything we can with what we have. So to me, that tells me they didn't keep his clothing. Um, I also cannot obtain a copy of his autopsy, even though it's public record and I'm family. Um, I have tried every which way possible, but I'm also told there probably wasn't one done because he was, we buried him two days later and he was taken to a place where Brown would never took their bodies to be autopsy. So I feel like that's the reason I can't get a copy is because there's not one. Um, there's just so many obstacles. I finally called the DA. His answer to me was, why do you need the autopsy when we all know what his demise was? I was like floored. Okay. And I was like, because I want to know if there's other injuries. I want to know um, what exactly happened because no one has told me. Mm. I just, I'd, I had to hang up because... I didn't have words to express how that hurt and angered me so much by his words. Like, how callous of you. The, the whole thought process, these people know Leon. That's what right. gets me even more infuriated. Like, it would be different if it was just like a rumor of so-and-so said something to so-and-so. But if right. these are actual people who have been in Leon's life and they are like tight-lipped about it, 
that infuriates me even more. Like, how do you sleep at night? Like, how does that work out? But I digress. You know, as far as not being able to obtain any records, that's very, very frustrating. But I feel that at the time this happened, that proper investigation was not done. And maybe that now they're just trying to cover up what happened then because they don't want to admit what was that they didn't do their jobs. And so the cover up just goes on and on and on for 26 years now. Um, At the time, they um, destroyed Leon's car almost immediately because we were told the fire and water would destroy any evidence. But as we now know, that's not always the case. They can still find evidence. Um, I know of other cases where the vehicle was saved for many, many years and then testing was done. Um, But that was not the case with Leon's. And also, um, I have a newspaper clipping of that morning where six deputies were standing literally on the spot Leon's body was without any protection, booties, gloves, nothing like that. The owner of the gun range where he was on the other side of the fence, the owner standing there chatting away with the deputies. And I'm told that, I mean you're not supposed to have anybody there while you're investigating, let alone the owner who happens to be a deputy as well. Um, And I have proof of that because I have the actual newspaper of that day. So to tell you the truth, the whole investigation was botched either because of inadequacy or just on purpose. I don't know, but it was. And now I'm just being given the runaround because they don't want to admit Not only has Leon been taken away from me, not only is this person still walking free, living his life, going on vacations, buying houses and trucks, but now I can't get any help or cooperation, nothing. And so I just, I get really, really mad and depressed at the same time because I I'm also fighting this battle for justice alone. None of the family wants to help me or be a part of it. And so I just feel awfully alone and it's hard to keep going, but I know that I have to for Leon. Mm -hmm. And I just hope that in my lifetime, that just a small part of justice will be done here. Even if it's just where the sheriff's department admits that they messed up you know, um, just something to, just to show that Leon was somebody and he did matter. Yeah. Just something, something like an inkling of anything. I mean, this is, this is more than a quarter of a century has gone by. He would have found the love of his life. He probably would have had heartbreaks like everyone else who had gone. But the point is that he had a life to make those choices and to go through those emotions and to find love and to find someone to settle down with, marry, have children. I know. know. So many things. Now, I mean, you know, if he did drop by, you know, what would be your ideal ideal thing that you would do to spend together? What would it look like? I Well, first, I would immediately give him the biggest hug and tell him how much I love him. Um, But I would want to meet his husband and his children, and I'd want him to see my children have grown up into being fathers themselves, and for him to see my grandkids, which I know they would love him, and he would love them, because that's just who he was, and just seeing that, him with my grandchildren gives me the biggest smile in my heart because family was so important to him and I would love for him to meet my family I would love for him to be a part of it again I don't know we would probably end up cooking and listening to music but um just being around all the kids would probably be the best thing ever for both of us Mm. Yeah, I, 
100%. I could see that. I could see that. Yeah. I can see it too, you know. What what even makes it harder is that your children and your children's children won't get to enjoy what you enjoyed having Leon in your life and having yeah. Leon in their lives and so on and so on and so forth. Like we uh-huh. lost a, a beautiful spirit because of someone's insecurities and someone's anger on something that was just should never have happened exactly it never have occurred senseless whoever is involved whoever knows anything we need to bring justice and closure for leon and arlene and her family it's just do one better if you weren't able to do it 20 60 years ago do it now come come forward something come across and say you know what I knew something. I was afraid. It's it's human nature to to have these multiple di- these different emotions. Yes, it's okay to be afraid. Leon was afraid. He moved forward in what he wanted to do. He knew what was best for him and his life and his future. Think the same for you. You know, whoever you are is listening to Arlene talk about Leon and the best times that she's had that's gone and the best that you can do for her and Leon is to give that information and to find some type of peace and closure for not only for her family but for you like why would you want to live the rest of your life tossing and turning about what you should have and should have could have done do it now and you know rest easy you can also use Crime stoppers and be anonymous that way also. Absolutely. It needs to come to some type of closure. You, we all need to be in some type of headspace of peace and mm-hmm. respect of ourselves and the people around us. Maybe you did something wrong and you hate yourself for it. That happens all the time. You don't have to hate yourself anymore. Let it go and let there be closure for yourself and Arlene and Leon's families. Thank you. Yes. um, Like, I'm not here to judge anyone. I don't know your situation on why you couldn't or wouldn't speak up before. That doesn't matter to me. What matters is that we all remember Leon, the beautiful soul he was. He knew almost everyone in town. Everyone said he was such a kind, loving, caring person. You know that about Leon. He was a beautiful soul. So he would do it for you. Please speak up now. Please give him some peace. Give me some peace. I I will not I will not judge you. I promise. I just want Leon to not be forgotten. If only I met Leon, um, I wouldn't even know what to do with myself because he just seems like he was just he was full of life and you know. Yeah, to know Leon was to love Leon. He was just that kind of person. Exactly. And where he left off, we carry, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's not just Arlene's carrying it. It should be the community that should be carrying it because. Yes. It's, we are, we are all one. No matter the circumstances, the situations, the, the chapters in our lives, we are all connected in some way, some form. And it's like, Yes. Even though you think that it didn't affect you, it really does. It affects you even if you are finally hearing it for the first time. Leon's story. It's yeah. it, you know, it we have that sixth degree of separation in our lives, but really we're closer than that. Genetically, mm-hmm. hereditarily, historically, culturally, on all levels. Any updates and news that you'd like to share that wasn't shared before on other podcasts? Um, yes, I got a call yesterday from a Cold Case Project, and they're going to feature Leon's case next Friday, which I'm super excited about. Yes, um, there will also be another podcast coming out next week on True Consequences. I did have to redo his Facebook page, Justice for Leon Lorellis. Because it was taken down. 
and I could not bring it back up, which put me into downward spiral that uh, I put so much time and effort and emotions, energy into it. I just, it really, it really got me down, Mm. but I finally got a new page started again. Um, Um, As well as that GoFundMe, that's still active. I would love to push that. Yes. Um, because that is so in dire need right now. It's mm-hmm. been in dire need for 26 years. That's for damn sure. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it, it, that's also frustrating because you see some of these cases that have like $80,000 and it's taken me over a year to get $4,000. And that's only because of podcasters help, you know, and auctions and they've donated because otherwise I wouldn't have anything at all. There's many times where I just, I do feel like quitting because there's so many obstacles that I face and it gets really hard, you know, mentally. And, but then I have to pull myself together and say, no, I can't quit because I have to do this for Leon. He would do it for me. So I have to do it for him. For sure. Talking about somebody's life, you know, it's not just a one short sentence answer. Exactly. A lot to people. So there's a lot of nuances. And I mean, that's how life is. Life is complex. And I think that's the reason why I wanted to talk with you because you can only get so much from black and white, from words, Mm -hmm. from you know, when someone else talks about someone else, like you really are just like, you only got the gist of what this person really entail. Like this person is precious. It's, yes. So I love what I do because I want yeah. people to feel that, like make it matter. It's right. not just, it's not just a random person. This is a person who had love in their life. A person who was loved. That's what I try to express. It's like, he did matter. He may be forgotten to most people, but not to me. He mattered. And it's not, it's not fair that his life was taken. And it's not fair to just forget him. Mm -hmm. It's not right. And so that's the reason I started reaching out to podcasters, because I want people to know who he was. I want people to know that he did matter and that someone needs to be brought to justice for what they did to him. And, you know, it's not right that they get to live their lives and Leon didn't. So, yeah, I just need to share that with people in hopes that eventually somebody will be brave enough to speak up about what they know. I'm I kudos. And if anyone hasn't said anything, you know, anything to you, um, I commend you and I see you and I thank you for oh. being here on here, Arlene. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you so much. I, I wish I could give you a big hug right now. I just, I just love you. I feel like you're my person. You're my yes. kind of people, you know, I can just talk to you. I obviously, you know, <laughs> three hours, but yeah, thank you so much for taking this time. Mm-hmm. Thank you for helping me get Leon's story out there. And thank you for caring for all the families. Absolutely. No, thank you. I Yeah, and I appreciate that. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to to uh, hold hand in hand and sharing this, this opportunity to keeping Leon's name in the light. He deserves that. If you like to learn more information about the timeline of Leon Loralis, there is detailed information on uncovered.com, as well as if you have the opportunity to go through the GoFundMe and to donate to hire a private investigator. And if you have any information, please contact the Heart of Texas Crime Stoppers at 800-222-8477 anonymously. Let's find justice for Leon. All the links are in the show notes. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Hands Off My Podcast. If you are enjoying the podcast, 
and you'd like to support the mission, I do have a Patreon membership that will help the cause and bring more detail on cases and stories from the people of color community. If you yourself has a lost loved one or a story suggestion, please don't hesitate to contact me at email. Hands off my podcast at gmail.com. And if you are only able to support in another way, please give this podcast a five star rating on Apple or Spotify and continue to listen to upcoming episodes every Thursday, wherever you listen to your podcast. Dios te bendiga.